Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first panel session of the 2017 Pleiades Conference. Uh, my name is Mike McConville. I'm the coordinator of the Bueller Planetarium uh, down in Seminole State College, just north of Orlando, Florida. Uh, and today, uh, our first panel is all about the challenges and opportunities that are facing college and university planetariums. And so uh, we've been dealing with this for uh, the length of the, the time of our planetarium. Our planetarium's been open about 25 years. Uh, just got an operating budget about three or four years ago. Uh, it's minimal. It covers the things that it's supposed to cover and nothing else. Uh, and so it is always the constant search for grants and for other opportunities. Uh, and of course, we've got different schedules. We serve our community in different ways. And so hopefully this morning, uh, we can all come to a better understanding of how to help each other as we work in the college and university system. So very, very briefly, I'm just gonna introduce all of our panel members this morning, and then each of them is gonna have some time to introduce themselves and give a little bit of background as to why this is uh, such an important panel of them. Uh, first, Derek Demeter. Hello, everybody. Uh, Derek Demeter. Uh, then uh, David White, Ann Bragg, Katie Maurer, Emily Roll, and David Hurt. Mr. Demeter, the floor is yours. All right, so hello everybody. So uh, my name is Derek Demeter, as mentioned, I'm the director of the Emmobiler Planetarium at Seminole State College, of just north of Orlando. Uh, and uh, basically, Mike kind of already introduced a little bit about what we are. Uh, we're a 30 foot dome. Uh, we're set settled in a essentially two year college that just uh, upgraded, I guess you could say, to a four year college. We do now offer bachelor's degrees. And uh, essentially, we pretty much service the entire community of Central Florida. Uh, there's really no true other planetarium in the area. So uh, here we are in this, uh, this college in a 30-foot dome, about 55 seats, uh, basically serving a population of around 3 million people. Uh, so that becomes a little bit of a challenge. So we're, you know, we've created some really interesting, unique things to solve that. Uh, our, and one of our biggest things is our outreach programs. So I'm looking forward to talking more about that later on. But, uh, but yeah, so I'm very excited to be part of this panel and uh, look forward to answering questions and, and discussing. Thank you, Derek. Mr. Weigel. All right, thank you very much. Uh, like I said, my name is David Weigel and I'm the planetarium director at the Christenberry Planetarium at Samford University. That would be Sam, not Stan. And uh, that's in Birmingham, Alabama. And we are a small, a small liberal arts school. Um, variety of degrees as well as a pretty uh, reasonably large uh, graduate program for the, the size of the college. And we also are the sole planetarium uh, in our city, so we serve all of the Birmingham community and a good bit of the surrounding area uh, as well. Uh, I believe we're one of four or five um, planetariums in uh, the state and not very many within the uh, surrounding area. So we do serve a, a very large population. We're a 40 foot dome. We seat just under 100. And we were, uh, we've been a planetarium since 2001 and were initially built uh, solely for university use. And I guess the goal was to provide a planetarium experience uh, for the university, whatever that means exactly. And that wasn't really fulfilled, and it was sort of put into the ground, uh, almost. And I was hired three years ago, and we've been reviving that as much as possible, and trying to do as much public outreach as we can, as much university outreach. Um, and without getting too long-winded, I'll tell you a lot more about that momentarily. So thank you for having me today. Thank you, David. Ms. Bragg. All right, well, my name is uh, Ann Bragg, and I'm the planetarium director at the Anderson Hancock Planetarium, which is at Marietta College in Marietta, Ohio. Uh, the college is a small liberal arts college. We have about 1,200 students, and our community is not particularly large. We have about 15,000 residents, but we are in the uh, less affluent part of Ohio, the Appalachian part of Ohio, and so um, certainly many of the visitors coming to see us are not particularly well off, so um, we generally do most of our outreach programming at no charge for our visitors. Because of that fact, we want them to be able to come. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge that faces us is that we really don't have 
any real staffing for our planetarium, which limits uh, what we're able to do. And I suspect that there are many in the audience who are in similar situations, um, kind of doing everything on their own. So um, that may be something we get a chance to explore a little bit more, but I will uh, save it for the questions later. Thank you, Anne. Ms. Mauer. Uh, my name is Katie Mauer. I am a senior student operator at Olivet Nazarene University. We have a strictly planetarium on our campus. Um, I'm an English major, but I've gotten into astronomy. Um, Olivet is, like I said, it's a Nazarene school, so it's private, and it's pretty small. It's about 3,000, 4,000 undergraduate students, um, and it's in a can uh, the community of Bourbonnais, Bradley, Kankakee. It's about four hours <coughs> north of here. Um, and the planetarium so far has focused on mostly community outreach, so this year we're going to focus more on um, campus outreach, and so we're going to talk about more about that later, and then Emily can tell you more as well. Thank you, Katie. Ms. Roll. Good morning. My name is Emily. Um, I'm an engineering student at Olivet Nazarene. Uh, I've become involved in the, uh, the planetarium and astronomy, uh, similar to the way that Katie has. Um, we work with uh, Stephen Case, who some of you may know, and so Strickler Planetarium is a 30-foot dome. We've got 50 seats. Um, a lot of what we do is uh, students coming in from local grade schools and places like that. We have our public shows every other weekend. So we have some, we have a lot of community coming in like Katie said, and we're working on building our, our reputation with the, with the students where we bring in students um, in, their, in their various classes at the university. And, and utilize the, the planetarium in that way in maybe like biology classes or geology classes and things like that. So I think maybe we'll, we will also address some of that later in some questions. But that's, our, that's our planetarium. Thank you, Emily. And finally, Mr. Hurd. David Hurd. I teach at uh, Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. It's in Northwest Pennsylvania. Uh, we have approximately 7,000 students that attend Edinburgh University. We're in an area that serves approximately 150,000 people with Erie and the surrounding area. There are two active planetariums there, mine and one at uh, Penn State Barron College also. So there's a lot of competition, but it's a healthy competition. Um, we basically have a 30-foot dome with uh, 61 seats. We're looking to hopefully upgrade because, uh, as I kind of heard the common theme, it's kind of like a realtor, location, 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 only ours is funding, funding, funding. <laughs> so we're uh, hopefully going to uh, work to improve that. Well, thank you to all of our panelists. And so we're going we're gonna to get right to it. Uh, our first question today is going to be about your utilization, uh, who you are and what you do. Uh, specifically, how do you utilize your planetarium? Uh, and then with a focus on your balance between community outreach and then what you do for your immediate college community. Are we, are we basically? It has, or is it a free for all? <laughs> well, I, That's why I'm moderating. So <laughs> free for all, like a jump. I will jump in there. At Edinburgh University, ours is kind of dual purpose. So we teach classes in there, as many of you do, I'm sure also. So classes are held in the planetarium, but we also have an outreach to the K-12 schools and also to the general public. So I think that's probably a common theme for, for most of us is as far as usage. Um, I would say that, uh, oh, I would say 80% of our, our, our student, or 80% uh, of our people that come to the planetarium are the K-12 schools, and then it breaks down from there. Yeah, I, I would, um say that our usage is similar. We, we have lots of K-12 groups coming to the planetarium as well as other community groups like civic organizations like the Kiwanis and the Lions and, and things like that. So that is, yes, probably about 80% about of who's coming into our planetarium. Um, and we also teach classes in the planetarium. Um, one thing that we haven't done a lot of is, is activities specifically for the college audience um, we do things when we're asked to, like for homecoming and so on, we'll have some programming. But that is an area that I would like to expand into, is doing more for the, just the local college students. 
I would say uh, for us, it's pretty much similar. Our biggest uh, population that we serve are the K-12 students. Um, we do our Seminole Space Science Program, so we're geared mainly in our county, but we also serve uh, the surrounding counties as well. We have, uh, we have Seminole County, which is the county that we're in, and then Orange County, which is where Orlando is, and uh, Lake County and Volusia County. So we kind of bleed out into those different counties. Uh, but our biggest population we serve is Seminole County, and we have a very, very good relationship with our school district. And so we have uh, d distinct programs for each of those grade levels. Uh, the next one is our general public. Um, and believe it or not, our, our third is actually the student population of the college. Uh, for some reason, that's probably been one of our more challenging things, is actually bringing college students in terms of, uh, besides extra credit for their teachers, um, you always know which one they are. They, they come into the planetarium, they look all like, what's going on? And then you're like, extra credit? And the first thing they come out with, instead of saying, hello, how are you doing? It's, I'm here for extra credit. And you know, you just you give them the ticket, and you tell them you write your 6,000 page essay, and you're good to go. So, um, but uh, anyways, um, but uh, as far as bringing classes into the planetarium, that's something that we're trying to work on. Uh, we have a lot of um, things beyond astronomy, a lot of curriculum beyond astronomy that we do for the general public that we want to integrate into the uh, student, uh, the classes at the college. And uh, a lot of it is that a lot of our faculty. Uh, just have a very, very heavily involved, uh, you know, curriculum that a lot of times they can't fit us in, but we're trying to work with that now. Uh, now that the college itself has what's called a faculty institute, basically a collaboration of faculty. And we've given programs to those events, and uh, we've slowly been building up the, uh, the repertoire, or building up the uh, population for, for college classes to visit the planetarium. Uh, so we are of course, similar. Uh, in some regard, uh, one of the challenges we face is that we do host classes in the planetarium every day in the morning, and that's not very beneficial for hosting field trips. Field trips want to be in the morning. And so we do host a good number of field trips. Um, however, we, we probably are closer to 70% of our participants being from the general public and then maybe the rest K-12 and the university. Um, we do have quite decent uh, university participation as far as students are concerned. It's, uh, I wouldn't say it's the hottest thing to do on campus, um, but I have a few students here and they sure like it. Um, they also work for me, so that's their bias. <laughs> but, um, but we do have we do have a good number of students come through our doors. We do also, um, we do cater to classes when we can that aren't just being taught in the planetarium, but if people, um, if teachers are approaching topics like uh, anything astronomy related, particularly things like scientific revolution uh, related topics, uh, we try to get them into the planetarium and we can do a full dome presentation for them uh, on, on these types of topics and, and give, an, give an idea of sort of set the stage of what what thinking was like a very, very long time ago uh, in the time of ancient Greeks, for example, and then scientific revolution thinking, and then where we're at today. Uh, and that's been very popular around campus. And we're really working, uh, like Derek said, to, to expand that as much as possible, uh, to be able to take things like history classes uh, and pull data onto uh, the dome of where um, maybe uh, armies moved to from country to country um, or, or different things whatever sort of data visualization you want um, you can do that in a PowerPoint that's fine but if you do it on the dome it's a much more memorable and immersive experience and so we're trying to convey that to teachers and they don't get it to a good extent uh, which is a bit frustrating but we're working on it uh, so at the Strickler we're, we're very similar to all of the other planetariums that we've had here where the majority of our, uh, of our participants come from K-12, followed by the general public. But in our, in our college student population, uh, we've been able to have several events um, that, that are rather interdisciplinary. So. The, the lobby and the dome occasionally are used regularly for senior art uh, presentations, 
So we utilize the lobby as a gallery for them and they're able to do their, their presentation in the dome if they would like or just in the, in the planetarium at large. And we also have nights where we have um, music, uh, music faculty maybe or music students who come in and they perform their pieces in the dome. Occasionally we have visualizations from our different shows or from our laser light shows. And so we've been able to integrate a little bit, <coughs> excuse me, um, a little bit into a different, a different genre that some of the others I think maybe don't reach out to. And Katie has been involved with different PR, uh, a PR team that has been working with the planetarium. So I think she, she has a couple comments on that. Yeah, um, I'm in a couple of PR class. I'm an English major. I take a communications minor with public relations. And some of the events that we've done that were, especially this semester that we're doing a lot, um, which is campus events, like we're trying to get more students just involved and aware that the planetarium is there. Because a lot of even my closest friends that know that I work there, they say, oh, we've never been inside. We didn't know that they have shows. And some of them, I think, are a little confused as to what a planetarium actually does. They think it's more of like an observatory. Does something. the roof open? Yes. <laughs> um, so one of the events. Yeah. So one of the events that we have planned this semester is in one of like the um, the cafes on campus, and it's the planetarium director, Dr. Case, who is in here right now, and the university chaplain, because it's a Christian college, so we kind of like name recognition, and they're just going to be in the cafe talking about. Um, like exoplanets and the possi possibility of extraterrestrial life, and, but then the theological perspective and implications of that in a really casual setting to try to get students involved and just aware of what we do. Um, and I know a couple of other classes, courses in general, sometimes they just have movie nights in the dome. We don't do a full dome projection, but just a projector onto the front of the dome. So it's kind of cool to just go in there and see. Um, and in terms of community outreach, like we said, we have our public shows every Saturday. Um, like I said, we only see about 50, but it's, we get a pretty good crowd, especially over the summer with the eclipse that I'm sure we've all had a really big boost of talking about that. Um, we got pretty popular and busy over the summer, so we're hoping to carry that over into our shows this year. And field trips and community groups coming in, like Emily said. Last year with my PR team, we planned a couple of community events. We planned a craft night with a local children's museum. Um, and it was just a fun way we had like space themed crafts and it was on National Craft Day, it was back in March. And it was just a great way to work with another established organization in the community to try to pull the name recognition, but to get ourselves in there as well and get space themed to get a lot of people interested. And we also had an educators workshop which ca capitalized on the eclipse. We had one of the eclipse shows and we, had, we got some materials actually from the Children's Museum that wasn't they weren't geared towards the children's museum like audience. They were a little, little too advanced, so they just donated it to us. So we had this educators workshop. We invited all the educators in the area to come and get. It was about an hour long. We showed them the eclipse. We showed them different ways of teaching about it with different models. Um, and that would probably just reflect into more field trips, but it was a way we're more focused on just getting our name out there into the community so that people are aware of what we do. All right, our next question is going to focus precisely on those programs. Uh, one of the salient issues uh, in colleges and universities is that our planetariums do not have a consistent audience stream. Uh, and so it is oftentimes the quality of our presentations, rather than the quantity of presentations, uh, that help to define our institutions. And so at your individual institutions, how do you produce and procure your content for the dome? So we're as a... Um any of you like many of you know me like I like to brag about the fact that we do all live programming at the planetarium. Uh, we have about uh, 50 to 60 varieties of shows ranging from uh, what's up in the night sky to uh, the origins of Halloween to uh, uh, looking at Chinese and Japanese astronomy to uh, the Civil War to investigating tropical cyclones uh, and uh, debunking science myths like Bigfoot on Mars. Um, it's a real show by the way. Um, it's a real show. Uh, actually, Mike and I dress up in costumes. We're Dr. I'm Dr. D, and he's Reggie Pennington. It's like a talk show, kind of like Jimmy Kimmel or something like that. We actually banter between each other. 
And it, it's, it's, it's fun, it's fun. We, we enjoy doing that. So, uh, but anyways, the one nice thing about being in a college planetarium that I see is that um, we have a lot more freedom, at least at our institution, we have a lot more freedom in designing how, when we do shows. Um, so we can spend more time creating these unique types of uh, programs and not feel like, oh, we have to present a show at 10 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 4 o'clock, or you know, whatever it is. We have public shows on Friday and Saturday nights, and we have complete control over when we want to do those shows. And there's sometimes we don't have a show going on in the planetarium on Saturday night because we're actually at Canaveral National Seashore doing a night sky uh, star party. Or we have these huge, giant star parties like our Winter Sky Festival, which is actually the largest astronomy event in the state of Florida. Uh, we had over 6,000, 7,000 people at that event uh, last year. Um, and um, we, you know, we, we have a lot of freedom. That's the one nice thing I do like about working in a college I, I've discovered from talking to people uh, from the museum world is that we have the little bit of ability to say, okay, well, we don't have to do as many shows, but the shows that we're gonna do are gonna be unique. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna try to be able to produce programs like that. Uh, and we, we use Uniview for most of our shows. Uh, the nice thing about our system is that um, it's all on the fly, so we can create and produce content that we can show on the dome. Uh, we also have a unique thing where we actually um, created a, essentially a projector that can work in pretty much uh, a dark type of environment, like when we have our Minolta MS-8 turned on, where we can actually show visuals and slides and stuff like that. And it actually covers about, you know, 40, 50% of the dome, so it makes it look like it's actually a full dome type of uh, image. Um, so we were able to incorporate a lot of that kind of stuff, but the most important thing that makes us unique is our storytelling aspect. All the shows are done live, so it's either Michael or me that are pre presenting those shows, and we add in a lot of comedy, we add in a lot of that kind of unique storytelling aspect that makes people uh, want to come back. And, uh, and so those are things that uh, I feel that are unique and important when we develop programs is that uh, since we don't have that constriction of, of being in a you know schedule we have to have these scheduled shows all the time we can we can be a little more creative and, and design shows that are, are uh, that are a little uh, a little bit more unique than the average uh, planetarium um, we don't really do any full dome shows per se um, because we because we built up this reputation in the in the community as being Mike and Derek. I mean, the planetarium, in many ways, is Mike and Derek. Uh, when people come to the planetarium, they don't just come to the planetarium; they they, they get a chance to experience us as, and and our planetarium. It's like our, our you know we're we're kind of symbiotic. You know, we feed off of each other, and uh, and that's something that is unique. And I, I like to stress that you know if you're in your college community, you know. Get connected with your community, get connected with your students, get connected because people are gonna see you as the planetarium, especially with the fact that we might only have one or two people working in the planetarium. Uh, being connected to those people will help them wanna come out and see you and see what you do. All right, to, well, you, you say unique, but uh, that sounds like exactly what we do. Um, which is awesome, yes. which is awesome. Um, we do also exclusively live programming, and uh, we are a mirror dome setup uh, that's homemade and runs Worldwide Telescope exclusively. We do no pre-made full dome content. Um, the way we structure our shows, uh, we start off with, I say no pre-made, uh, we make a video in Worldwide Telescope somewhere in the five to 12 minute range and set it to music, maybe include some text, maybe not, and it's awesome. And it gets people really, really pumped. And you're all asleep, you're not very pumped yet. But uh, if you watched one of our videos, you would be. And if you wanna make one, you can later. We have a workshop for that this afternoon. But that aside, uh, we get people very, very excited about um, the cutting edge research, discoveries, these sorts of things that are going on in astronomy through this live programming, and we're able to pull in data as it becomes available and uh, talk about it for our audiences. And so uh, we are also developing a, rep a reputation among the community for being uh, the, the leaders in astronomy and uh, the public education, uh, the distilling uh, or the distributing of this information to the public. And so, um, again, we, we have a lot of control over when we give presentations. I don't work on weekends, and that's a fantastic thing. I work 
lots and lots of hours uh, throughout the week, but um, I can I can pick when those shows are. So we do public presentations on Thursday evenings at eight o'clock, and generate pretty pretty solid attendance um, just by word of mouth. Uh, we have we have very minimal funding as many of you uh, surely do. And so we don't really have uh, great means of advertising, uh, short of uh, we basically use social media and word of mouth. And uh, it's the compelling nature of our presentations, uh, I think, that really helps to, to bring in these crowds. Um, what we enjoy most about the, the live and interactive nature of it is that it's not, it's not a lecture. Um, it's, a, it's a journey that we are taking with you together to all learn something. And so it's, a, it's not me giving a presentation knowing more than you. It's let's all embark on this together and find out something awesome about the universe. And that's a very powerful, a very powerful thing to bring into uh, to presentations. It, it really gives credibility to, to uh, what you're saying. So I guess, sorry. So I guess on the flip side, well, that was a very briefly at Strictly, we have, we, I guess, rely on the full dome productions of the shows that people come and watch. Um, and then after the shows, we usually offer like live star talks. Um, and that depends on the age of the group, like the group dynamics and how in depth we go, depending on what we talk about in the video. Um, and various demos that we can do, but mostly just do like the nice guy constellations and some like the story, star lore, I guess. Um, and then we do have opportunities for the audience to ask questions of whatever they're interested in, and then we kind of play off of that as well to depend on how in depth we go. Um, every once in a while, if it's like a sort of like a special request, we can do customized show. Like earlier this semester, there is a geology class that we had to do like a customized Star Talk demo show with that was talk about the formation of the planets and evolution of the universe and something else. I did it and I already don't really remember it, but it's fine. Um, so every once in a while we can customize and we can stitch together clips of all of our different shows to cater to our audience. Um, and I think maybe part of that is that the, we don't, all of our employees are students, so we all already have other obligations kind of short on time so I feel like we won't really have time to put together a live show that's as long as our public shows but maybe that's something that we can explore in the future <laughs> then Anne. yeah well I, I would say so at, at our planet time we do use full dome shows um, but that's not what the entire program is because again because we're not a museum and we're not trying to do a a new group coming in every 30 minutes, usually if we have a public show, it is the one public show that's going on that evening, and so there's no specific time we need to be finished. So um, generally a, a program that we do would start with about a 30 minute live star talk, um, which, which we try to make interactive. I keep saying we, but I'm, I am the, the staff, so I guess it's the royal we here. It just makes us, we the planetarium. No, I, I do have a volunteer or two, so I guess, I guess she's part of the we, but. Um, Mini we. Right, so generally start with a, with a live, somewhat interactive full dome show. Sorry, not full dome show, star talk, there we go. Um, and then show the, the full dome video. Um, usually in the Star Talk, I'll try to make some connections to what's in the full dome show if it's appropriate to do that. Um, but then we always finish with a live Q&A time. And I think that's really important because I think at a lot of museums that doesn't happen. I, I know in some that it does, but um, I, I like the fact that my audience gets a chance to ask questions of somebody who actually has some expertise in the area of astronomy and who can um, actually give them reasonably educated answers to most of their questions. Of course, if they ask me something I don't know, I will freely admit that I don't know, or if I'm, if I'm making an educated guess, I'll tell them that too. Um, I would like to use the full dome shows a little less, I suppose, but it, it comes down to staffing. I, I really, I, I teach a 4-3 teaching load at my college, and then I'm doing the planetarium on top of that, so there's just really no time to be creating anything 
um, new from month to month. That's going to be a great segue, Dave. I'll let you. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I also have about a third release time as planetarium director, so most of my duties are professor, and, and so I think we're all balancing that. You know, how do we balance that? How do we teach our classes and also do all these groups? Almost all of our programs are live. Uh, we do have some CAN programs also. And I think that's really important, it has been for us, primarily because of the changing demographics. And I don't know about you, I'm very curious, but over the last three or four years, we used to have maybe 10% of our, our incoming people were um, uh, the uh, special needs groups, uh, life skills. And that has totally turned, I mean, about every other group that's calling to come in are life skills groups and you really need to be flexible with them you really need to be able to to go live if you will with those groups and i don't know if that's been a common theme throughout uh, colleges and universities and i think it has to do with funding that uh, a lot of the regular k-12 classes aren't getting the funding for field trips but uh, I'm, I'm just curious if that if, if other people have seen that but uh, coming back to yeah our live program fits into that changing demographics of doing a lot of groups that are life skills groups. Uh, now a quick poll of the audience, how many of you, uh, your planetariums, you do a majority of live uh, or content that you've created in-house? Shows where it's live or it is. So roughly about half the room, okay. All right, now, uh, is there more from the panel? All right, so one of the, the, the points that came out of that, and thank you for bringing this up, is the fact that it is increasingly difficult to create presentations if there is only one person uh, or one and a half, a full-time and a part-time uh, staff at your planetarium. And so uh, just briefly, what's the staffing situation at your planetarium? Uh, the next question, of course, to that would be, do you want more staff? And I'm just gonna answer for all of us, yes. Um, so, and, and, and uh, other very important thing as we kind of move towards the student side of it, um, what's your utilization of uh, students, student workers, federal work study, volunteers? Derek. Okay, uh, all right, uh, so um, the answer is yes, we could always use more staff, even though uh, Michael and I are both full-time. Um, I, my <clears throat> particular pay grade is administrator, so I can only work, basically, uh, I can't work overtime. Mike can, in fact, actually, that, he's very happy about that for the eclipse. Sweet, sweet, very, very hours happy about that yeah. eclipse. <laughs> Time and a half. Um, and uh, they're like, you know, so. Um, but anyways, um, we, we are under the point now where, you know, we, we started out with, with uh, one full-time planetarium director. Well, actually, originally it was a planetarium uh, paraprofessional. And uh, when I took over uh, from, and for those that remember Laurent Pellerin, uh, he was just a paraprofessional. And then uh, when I came in board, uh, we were able to kind of justify the human resource department that we really need a dedicated planetary manager. And so we were able to bring in a, a planetary manager and we still had a, a part-time uh, planetarium paraprofessional as well. But over the years, we were able to get Mike uh, full-time and then eventually uh, reclassify him as a, as so what we call you now a senior planetarium operator. Basically, he's a planetarium coordinator, but you know, the human resource department of the colleges, they're weird about their names, but in reality, he's the coordinator of the planetarium. He's the guy responsible for you know, coordinating and, 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 and reserving the field trips and making sure everything runs smooth. Um, and, but at this point now, we are in need of a potential part-time person. And uh, uh, we, uh, we talked to our work studies program at the college. The only problem with us is that we're a two-year college for the most part. Even though we have a four-year program, majority, most, about 80 to 90% of the students are, 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 are two years. So the problem with a two-year college, unlike a, a four-year or even you know, beyond, is that you get a huge turnaround. Uh, and you get those ebbs and flows. We, one year we did this incredible Halloween event with, with theater students, with, with uh, student government uh, students, student activities students, and it was phenomenal. However, the next year, most of them graduated. And then guess what? All of a sudden, we had a new core of students that just, it was like herding cats, you know? It was just, I mean, and, and so we have this problem where we have this constant up and down of students, where you get these really high class students that are, you know, working in these incredible, you know, working, either in the honors program, they're, you know, a lot of them are, are building up these amazing scholarships, and then the next year you have students where it's just like, planetarium, you know? And it's just, um, oh, I, I study astrology. Uh, you know, you got, you got, or you get the students to say they study cosmetology, but, um, but um, 
you know, these are things where we, that's the biggest challenge for us is that how, you know, how do we manage, we had this constant turnaround of students. So when we, when we finally find these students that are incredible to work with, they're either gonna graduate or they're, and a lot of them will go off to, you know, they won't go to UCF, they won't go to the local university. Some of them do and we, kept, we catch on with them and some of them become members of the UCF Astronomy Society and we keep them kind of helping us out as a volunteer. But a lot of them either go to UF or go out of state or out of the country and then all of a sudden we lose that really good talent. And usually the students that are very good are the ones that tend to go to really good schools that are usually out of the state. And so we're, we're under that problem where, you know, we build up this, you know, it takes a long time to get a student trained in the planetarium. It's not just like, here you go, you know, it's, it, you know, you, you, need to, you need to teach them how to use the planetarium, you need to teach them how to use a telescope, whatever it may be. And by the time they finally get used to it, they're going to graduate. Um, so it, that's our biggest challenge in our planetarium is how do we work with work studies and a lot of times work study programs are only good for a semester and uh, they're only good for 10 hours or five hours a day or five hours a week. Uh, five hours a day. That'd be great. Uh, five hours a week and so it, it, it makes it challenging. So what we decided to do is I think the best opportunity is, is for students anyways is to help out our big events. Again we created these large scale astronomy events our star parties, our, our sky festival. And usually we like to get students involved with that. What we do is we'll do a, a call to students to help out. A lot of the things that Mike and I need are support. We need support for you know helping us with, with, with those kind of things. So we designed a system to where majority of the shows and majority of the things that we do on a daily basis, Mike and I can handle. Uh, but we're getting at the point now where you know we're, we're in the talks of getting a portable dome because a lot of the schools uh, can't visit us. But they're like, can you, can you come to our school? So if we were to get a portable planetarium, we're definitely going to need to have somebody else to help with that. Um, so we're, we're kind of in a, a rough spot because we want to grow, but we can't because of the staffing issues. Um, and, uh, you know, actually a quick interjection for another audience poll. Uh, how many of you, the planetarium director or manager, highest level in the planetarium is a faculty position? Okay, so, so in the minority. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, actually, interesting thing is that you know, if, uh, the, my position, you can't teach uh, during core hours. So, uh, th and that's the same thing with any dean level or anything like that, because uh, you know, that's your your role is to do your job and whatever it is. So, um, and um, and so basically, what what it is is that uh, we're again we're in an issue where we we have these students that are turning around and we have to figure out a, a good solution to how do we build a, a volunteer program, how do we build something where we can, we can you know, get them in, train, help out for that little period of time, and then you know, they're off. So. Yeah, I, I'm a professor there, so I get four hours release time as a planetarium director out of the 12 load hours per semester. Uh, so, and I'm it, and so I rely heavily on students. I used to have a graduate student that work for me regularly and that helped immensely. Uh, however, that funding has been taken away. So now I'm relying solely on undergraduates. And you bring up a great point of the turnover. You just get them trained and then they move on. And so I just want to put in a little plug that a lot of my students are here and they have a program called CHAOS uh, that stand, well, they'll tell you all about what that stands for. But it's been a really neat program because it's student led and it's student generated. So it kind of keeps that pipeline open and I don't have to do a lot of work of recruiting the students. I kind of rely on chaos to be my pipeline to bring new students on board with me. And they're present, when are you guys presenting? Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, 10, 10, okay. So they're presenting on that, which I think is a neat, unique concept of a student led pipeline for the planetarium. So anyway, uh, same challenges though. <coughs> I do know that uh, Stephen Case, uh, he has had many of the same problems as would be expected. Uh, what he utilizes primarily is the single astronomy class that he teaches. Uh, he utilizes that to choose students who have shown an enthusiasm or an aptitude <laughs> for astronomy to which he, he offers a position as a planetarium operator and astronomy TA, similar positions. So in our planetarium, our shows are probably 80 or 90% run by student operators, and we are all undergraduate students as well. So Katie and I have been, 
probably a couple of the longest running uh, operators, as far as we're aware anyway. Uh, we began our positions after sophomore year and we are seniors and are planning to continue until we graduate. Um, so Dr. Case has specified many times, uh, what am I gonna do? We currently have seven operators, I believe, seven student operators, and from a student perspective, it gets to be difficult, um, I know, in scheduling too, because our class schedules sometimes make it very difficult for, uh, for field trips and different private shows to be scheduled in the first place. So it's difficult for us to, to find the hours to run shows, but it's also difficult to find students to run shows during class hours. So opposite sides of the same issue. Uh, so well, <laughs> Actually, that would, that would be perfect for us uh, because the next question is specifically for, uh, for the two of you, Katie and, and for Emily. What do you think would be a series of best practices to make it better for the student experience? What do you want to get out of being a student operator, student volunteer, and how can the planetarium field, specifically, of course, college and university, how do we better utilize the students, like give you a, a more effective experience? Um, <laughs> I think a lot of that has been accomplished in the last two years. Katie and I have both attended. Uh, we attended the GLIPA meeting last year in Flint, and we're here now. Uh, so I think that these conferences have definitely been something that has increased our enthusiasm for this, uh, for our position, for our planetarium, and it's also been a way for us to, to meet all of you who also attend these meetings and maybe make some connections like that if, if uh, your students are like us and would like to pursue positions in the future in the planetarium field, uh, these conferences are absolutely essential in my opinion. Um, we get exposure to many of the different things that as a small planetarium we don't have as much of an awareness of, like we don't build our own uh, full dome shows or anything like that. So we get to see the, the work that's being done in the field and the, the kinds of uh, the kind of opportunities that there are that our small campus planetarium doesn't have the facilities or the capabilities to carry out. And, and I think that students should be more aware that you don't, like, okay, so for me, like, I'm an English major, and I say that I work at the planetarium, people are always thrown off a little bit, like, how? <laughs> and, I mean, You're not an astronomy school, major? No, we don't even have that. Um, but, like, you don't have to be, like, a physics major or something in the science like there is like you can apply it to a lot of different areas and for me specifically since I'm on the social media side of things there's there are different aspects to a planetarium than just being in there knowing about space and working the projectors like you can do different things to get involved with the planetarium to get it involved more with the campus students to get more people involved um, interested um, I mean and the my, I mean, it's not like a, an official social media position. I'm still like a student, and it's for, uh, basically for another publications class, but something that I've been thinking about this semester is keeping the momentum going with social media, because previously it was just Dr. Case splitting his time between being a professor, the director, and doing the social media stuff, which, um, speaking for him, he did have scheduling conflicts this week with the school, probably with some family stuff as well, which is why he's not even here. So he's like, oh, that's ironic. You know, there's another challenge of being a professor and a planetarium director is that you have to split time. Um, so one of the things that we're concerned with this year is keeping the social media and then that, like students doing the other side of things for planetariums, um, social media event planning, campus events, outreach. Um, It's, you know, you know, astronomy is an incredibly visual medium. Um, how many of you actively use either Instagram or Snapchat? Yeah, so the, the, the hands that you think are gonna go up, go up and are missing. Uh, that, that really is one of the, the best possible ways that we can utilize students is that, you know, we're connected. Um, it's really, really easy for us to be able to get the word out and get the pictures up because it's, it's built into what we do. Um, so we're actually gonna move to, to a little bit more of, of the audience questions. Uh, I know all of you wanna talk about money, 
But the, the broad question is, do we need more of it? Oh, hell yes. Um, so if anything, uh, we can probably go a little bit more specific on those questions. But any, uh, anything from our, our audience this, uh, this morning? Hi, I'm Michael McGee from uh, University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. And we came across um, an interesting issue recently where in the past seven years I've been building up our planetarium to be more active in networking across campus. And we've been very successful at doing that. And a lot of good things have come out of that. But there's also a negative side to it, which is the uh, Dean of the College of Science, the professors in the astronomy department, are paying closer attention to what we're doing. And we recently had, uh, we hold college classes in our planetarium. We recently had one of the professors who teaches, who loves planetarium, say that one of his colleagues criticized a public presentation he came to because the student running it made a mistake about the sun. I think we were talking about eclipses or, or something like that. And uh, we went, oh, okay, um, what do you suggest about that? Well. He suggested that all of your shows should be presented by a PhD. We should not be using anyone less than a PhD. And, and the two students we have up here, our situation is very similar. So I'm just wondering what you think about that. Well, that's silly. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, um, we, I, think, I think that definitely comes, I mean, the more, the more success you have, the more popularity more popularity you have, definitely you're going to, to run into those uh, sorts of things, and, and we certainly have, um, whether it's people criticizing me uh, or some of my students. So, I mean, that's, that's sort of inevitable, but uh, what, what we do, I mean, people make mistakes, certainly. I mean, even if you know the material, you might just say the wrong units. Like, that happens. So, we, we really strive when I, when I train my students to present, it is, it is very, very rigorous. And uh, they can tell you, um, we, like I grill them with questions and that sort of thing, and they have to think on their feet. But on top of all of that, it, I mean, we really drill into them the mentality of don't assume to know things you aren't sure about. And so I think when you have the, when you go in with the mindset Again, of we are, we are sort of going on this journey together, and I'm telling you the things I know and telling you things that uh, I know with, with certainty and admitting when I don't know, um, it, it gives a little bit more credibility to things. And so people are sort of, it is a, it is a team effort when it's, uh, when it's that. The, the audience sort of rallies behind you as like, you are our fearless leader on this journey through space. And, when you're in it together, it's not necessarily like a, a lecture where it has to be perfect. It's not pre-done and everything has to be awesome. Uh, it, it's, it's sort of a, an experience. And so I don't know if that answers the question of what, how, do you, how do you react to that necessarily. It's more just, oh well. Sorry, they're, they're a bummer. <clears throat> Excuse me. First things first, uh, let's be honest here, it's the ego of the person that's been bruised and the jealousy because you guys are doing awesome work. But really, I've also had PhDs give talks at the planetarium and they said that the, uh, the planets rotate around the sun, so just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you're able to properly identify things. Um, so Let's yeah, not attack the academics though, come on. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. You know, we're, we're, all, we're all academics here. Um, so, but the point I'm mean being is that, um, you know, again, what, what David said, people make mistakes, I'm sure. Being in a, in a lot, especially if it's a live presentation, you know, I mean, the brain, you know, sometimes you accidentally say something that you don't necessarily mean you say, and, you know, if somebody says, hey, you know, you should correct them, or whatever, and you say, sorry, I, what I really meant to say was this. Um, and I really think, unfortunately, a lot of, I've, I've, I've heard this happen with other institutions that, uh, planetariums that maybe are not are necessarily run by the, the professors or whatever, they start getting a little jealous about the planetarium doing well and all this, and, and there's a lot of little internal conflicts between each of the institutions. Uh, but I think with the students, I think, you know, uh, just providing, you know, resources about like, you know, when, you, when you're producing a show, saying, you know, th these are the different things that we need to talk about, you know, uh, here's, a, here's, here's some pinpoints about, you know, little facts and data. I mean, of course, 
you know, the nice thing about the general, doing general public shows is you don't need to get really technical about things either. Uh, even with, with even student classes, like general astronomy classes, doesn't need to be really super technical or whatever. And so most students can digest these, these terms, especially working one-on-one -on -one with them, mentoring them. And, uh, but, uh, I, I mean, you know, if this was just one mistake, it, it could be, you know, I mean, if they were having, doing it in every single show, then, you know, that, that's, uh, that's another issue. I mean, uh, but um, a lot of it's just, you know, I mean, keep, what you, keep up what you keep doing and, uh, and hopefully they, uh, they realize what you're, what you're doing is great for the university and, yeah. and all that. Let me just add two things. I mean, as far as having PhDs for presenters, I, I think that doing a lot of public presentations to K through 12 school groups is not really what yeah, people right. get their PhD <laughs> intending to do. Yeah. Um, now, now I, I have a PhD and I know some other people in this room do as well, and I enjoy doing those programs, but, but this is really not what, yeah. what, what people are, are shooting for. Um, second, having been to some astronomy conferences, a lot of PhDs are terrible public <laughs> speakers. Um, I, I, planetarium conferences are so much more fun and astronomy research conferences because people can actually talk to an audience. Um, so, and, and then just in terms of errors, you know, I, I do a full dome show as part of most of my programs and, and I can think of very few full dome shows that don't have at least a moment or two that just have me cringing in my chair, yes, yeah. but I feel like it's, it's, it's a trade-off. And, and I, think, I think a lot of those special details, well, just one, there's one little thing. We're getting to the mic. Uh, okay, we're well, there's one last thing. Uh, is that <laughs> one last thing? Is that the general public or the people that come into planetarium are not going to remember every single detail you're going to learn in the show? So if they make a mistake, you know, I'm sure they're not going to remember. Thanks, you guys, for your information. Uh, I want to ask about the money because Michael talked to me last night, um, <laughs> and he remembered uh -oh. something I said. Um, how is your support from your campus? And I guess what I'm asking to use money terms is, in my case, I'm expected to bring in every dollar I spend. So I have to cover staff, my, my salary, staff's benefits, all the other things. So in my planetarium, I'm bringing in about $150,000 to $160,000 a year, which all completely goes out. Uh, for support from my campus is literally my electricity I use, and an hour of custodian a day. The building. Well, the building's there. <laughs> so, so for that, we have to do about 35,000 people a year, 25,000 school kids from 100 school districts, and 10,000 public running 42 weeks a year. So yeah, where are you uh, from? I'm from the University of Wisconsin, Fox Valley. Uh, so how do you get support from <laughs> or how, is, how do you feel your support is from your campus? Do you, ha do you function under those financial constraints? I know at times I feel like I'm a Coke machine. <laughs> if I don't sell enough Coke, we'll just take you out. So. Uh, uh, yuck. <laughs> I, I feel for you. Wow, that was painful. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, we have real good support from the university, but, but financially, very little. I mean, we get the PMA each year, and I am in a department with 12 other geologists, faculty, and uh, I'm just part of the line item budget of like 12,000 a year that has to be split between all of us. So I get very, very little, and that's why we do the programs we do, but uh, at least we get very, very strong campus support for what we're doing. They see it as a tool. They see it as an instrument to outreach as a recruiting tool. And I don't know, maybe we need to change that. I don't know how, but maybe we need to change that mentality. So I, wow, that's rough. <laughs> I, but that's my experience. I get good support, but very little funding. But I'll take the support yeah, over yeah. the funding. Yeah. See, we, uh, we have, um, we're a little bit different situation because we have, I wouldn't say it's good monetary support, but we have enough money to do upkeep. We don't have, they don't expect me to bring in any money, actually, um, which I think is silly on their part. And, um, but on the flip side, they also make it hard for me to make money, um, which is also absurd. So if I want to get, if I want to sell t-shirts, for example, I have to get approvals 
every single level. Um, that could take a month. Um, if I want to sell stickers, if I want to give away stickers, I have to do the same thing. Um, that's crazy. Uh, it's all about branding. Uh, so that that is uh, a big a big challenge in itself. I only recently have been allowed to charge for field trips, um, and now that we are, we're making lots of money, and they're blown away. Um, so. It's just a different scenario. It's it's very it's very hard for us to um, to raise enough money for us to do anything upgrade wise with our uh, very low end homemade system in a very very high end facility uh, because they make it so difficult for us to actually make money. Um, we wanted to we wanted to rent a laser show system um, and charge for that as a fundraiser, and they got really excited about it. And they said, okay, well. Uh, this is a great idea, and we'll look into it and get back to you on approvals. And a, a quick a comment over ago. here from Sarah. I just, this, I'm Sarah Schultz from Minnesota State University, Moorhead. Um, Alan, where did you go? Oh, there you are. Sorry, <laughs> you're moving around. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that I have the same situation. I have to pay for everything out of my own <coughs> revenue. Um, but I'm curious, something that I'm looking into is um, student fees. Um, do you, you're on a campus, right, college. Um, do students pay fees just for different things, like technology fee and things like that? They do. Okay, so they do have that. So for our campus, we have, um, they have the set ones, but then you can also do requests. So you can propose something to the um, student government and they have to approve those things. Um, but so I'm going to be looking at that, and that's something like students would pay like 25 cents a credit, and that would um, just change the game for my planetarium. So I don't know if you've looked into something like that, but that's maybe another option. We're in a weird relationship where we're part of the campus when it's good to be part of the campus, yeah. but we're not part of the campus when we're the red hair, green skin, three eyes that travel. <laughs> Sean Lodge from the University of Maine. Um, our planetarium is in a sort of hybrid comparatively. Uh, my, uh, I'm the single full-time employee and my salary is covered under general funds, but we are expected to earn all of our other operating income through our, our programming. And we do have student workers, both graduate students, which I'm very thankful for, one of them is here with me, uh, and undergraduate students as well. Um, but one of the ways we've sort of been trying to build relationships in the university is um, we do, of course, sell our, our services back to the university. So for instance, I'm part of the physics and astronomy department, but the astronomy department pays me for the use of the building for their labs. So I actually charge my own department, which to me seems really weird, but that's the way they do it. And I charge other departments on campus as well. But one of the things I've been doing over the last year is because even though I can support my annual operations, the technology replacement if you're a digital dome is difficult. But we've been reaching out to other departments on campus and creating sort of partnerships, if you will, to look at ways that we can do things with other departments to leverage and be seen as part of uh, the university in a bigger sense than just a place for astronomy. And that's actually got the dean and the provost interested in our technology replacement as a result. And they see us as being more integrated because the planetarium used to be a standalone silo to some extent, and now we branched off. We're doing things with the theater department. We're doing things with music. We're doing things with chemistry. We have a science lecture series where we pull in all different types of uh, university departments and get them to do some things in the dome, and then they see us as really a part of them for visualization. So I think a, a, a large part really can be helpful by building those partnerships uh, and collaborations on campus to be seen as more than just a place for astronomy. We love astronomy, that's our first love and our, our deepest passion, but we really have branched off and that's made a big difference in the way the university sees us um, as being more, more of a part of it. Yeah, um, the thing we have, the challenge that we have is we, all the money that we bring in goes to the general fund of the college. Basically, we call it the black hole of the college. <laughs> because in reality, it's funny because we think about it, we, we think about the money that we're producing, um, which actually our revenue, 
Right, so we get, a, we get a fixed budget every year. Our fixed budget is significantly lower than the amount of money that we bring in. <laughs> and anytime we, and what we usually, what I usually do is I always try to justify this by when I'm putting my budget, we get, we always do a yearly budget request for things that we want. And it always gets denied, but I'm like, but I'm always putting, I always look at the money that we bring in and I think, okay, I'm not gonna spend any more than that to justify, well, we brought in this much money, so we should justify having that money, but they never do that. And that just, and so that, that, but we're having discussions with our administration, we're talking about the importance. I think a lot of it is just really getting with your administration and talking about, look, we're not stepping over our grounds here. We we're making this much money. You know, can we, can we, is there, these are things that can help us with our department and, and all that. And uh, just trying to reach a compromise with them. But one of our biggest challenges is that we are bringing, thankfully our salaries are paid for by, uh, by another fund, which is nice. But uh, as far as getting, uh, anytime we throw money out, it's just kind of like, okay, well, we're not gonna see that money back. Why do we keep doing what we keep doing if we're just dumping money? But we think about, it, well, it goes to the greater good of the college, but it really doesn't because then when the administration hires another VP for some BS thing or whatever, it's just you're starting like, well, that's where our money's going. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just, uh, that's our biggest challenge and that we're trying to solve. And, uh, but we do get a lot of foundation. We have a foundation account that we get, we get uh, donations and things like that that we can funnel into. And the nice thing about that is we can spend it on anything we want. We want to do, we want to buy food. We want to, we want to buy t-shirts. We can go into that. And we've been doing a lot of sponsorships for our events that are not very helpful. All right, so we just have one more official question. This is a comment to combine both of the things that were asked already. So I work at a university also, um, and I, I wanted to say that Sometimes I heard here a bit of a uh, hostile, maybe no, hostile is too hard a word, but we 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 sometimes have second thoughts about astronomy PhDs. Um, I'll full disclaimer: I am one of them. Um, but I run a planetarium, and I love what I do, and I think that it's healthy to have the PhDs give talks because they have a chance to put out the word, their research. They love that because it gives them an item for their broader impacts. When they're writing NSF grants, they love to say, oh, I did these programs. But the audiences also recognize that this person is talking about their own research and that gets them excited because I can't talk about their stuff in the detail that they can. We have gotten money from people who come regular to the, regularly to the planetarium because they want to support that connection with the science who does the, the real thing. I'm a good supplement, but it's nice sometimes to hear it from the person. So that's good for the department that gives money to the planetarium from grants. So they write in the planetarium as part of their outreach arm and, the, and society enjoys hearing from the uh, scientists themselves. Now I do train the scientists. I do say these are the expectations so they also go out in the world better communicators. I, I like to echo a lot of what's been said. I, I think, you know, being a PhD who does teach in the dome, uh, we really have an excellent relationship uh, between Rice and the Houston Museum of Natural Science. I have a small portable at Rice that I use for my classes, and then when we do public outreach that we don't charge, we use the rice domes and it's an outreach and if we do uh, rentals to schools it goes through the museum and they get a, a revenue stream. So we kind of divvy up the revenue depending on, on what the audience is. So if it's, if it's strictly public outreach, rice does it or my company does it. Uh, and uh, uh, when we do uh, planetarium shows together, uh, we, Rice University handles the NASA grants because we have a grants office and the museum uh, gets part of the royalties. So it, it turns out to be a really excellent partnership that we can all work together. Uh, and, and, and that's it. I agree that occasionally a planetarium show has errors in it, and I had some cringe points myself. But um, 
most shows, if they're done right, have been vetted by a team. So if there is a mistake, at least it's not your mistake. <laughs> Whereas I mean, if you're up there talking and someone asks you a question and you, and you goof, then, then, then you've got egg on your face because it's you that forgot. So uh, having pre-made shows as at least part of the program at least takes <laughs> that worry off of you. And I, I, there's never been a show that we've created that, that our staff didn't learn something from. Uh, so, um, and then the last thing is, as far as revenue in versus revenue out, again, at Rice, we don't charge for anything because it, it, it does, it gets really ugly. Uh, but the, the things that we do charge then goes to the museum and then they have to make an argument. They don't automatically get that money back and that's one of the sad things is <laughs> they're expected to be revenue positive uh, you know, but they don't see often uh, the return when they, uh, when they do have a good year. Uh, so another way we've snuck around that one is my, uh, my company does the, the licensings of the shows. And so the museum often instead of getting cash for their royalties, they'll get equipment. So they say, oh, instead of, you know, instead of royalties, will you buy me a new projector? And, and that's turned out to be really helpful. <laughs> All right, so we wanted to be respectful of time. We're, we're running a bit over, but I'm on the next panel, so it's okay. Uh, and so uh, what we'll do, I, panel members, if you're okay to stick around for a little bit, maybe a little bit more one-on-one -on -one up here at the front. Uh, but uh, a round of applause for our panel members this morning. Thank you guys so much. And uh, I want to say thank you, Michael, for being our moderator. Uh, 36 hours ago, I had no idea I was moderating. So. Uh, yeah. We realized the last minute, but we really appreciate you uh, doing this for us. And so thank you, everybody.